back in the United States of America. And if you're joining us today, welcome. We have just wrapped up a four-month lecture <laughs> tour across the East Coast of the United States, across Europe. Our last stop was Luxembourg, and it was amazing. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. So yeah. a very big thank you to all of our patrons and followers and students who have made this trip possible. It is also quite wonderful to be back, <laughs> um, to be back home, to be back with our possessions. We finally have our books and our libraries and all the things that we can actually use for these classes. So yeah, big, big, big thank you. We hope that you guys also enjoyed the trip. It was amazing getting to teach a different class in a different city pretty much every week for the past four months which is just amazing and exhausting. Like, <laughs> I don't know how bands do it when they have to perform somewhere every single night. For us, it was once a week, but it was still amazing and exhausting. So thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts for supporting us on our very first lecture tour. I think we had like 12 stops, 11 stops, 12 different cities, something like that. So that was amazing. Um, if you guys would like to download those classes, they're all available on Patreon. You can download them as a podcast to listen back, and you can sort of follow us retroactively across across Europe and the U.S. as we teach those classes. But today, we are back in Washington, and we're going to be bringing you a one-hour introduction to Zizek and Lacan class. We're going to be talking about female versus male sexuality and about difference. So if you'd like to stick around, this class is going to be for complete beginners. Although if you're more well-read, you're more of an expert, you'll probably get enjoyment out of it as well. It's going to be a 60-minute introductionary class. The class is totally standalone, but it is part of a series. Um, the series is called The Useless Precaution. You don't have to have watched the other classes, but if you're interested, you can always go to the Patreon where you can download every single class every week and sort of keep up with us as we go along. I think Jenlyn also has an announcement about the book. Yeah, this is going to be, I mean, it's the beginning of July, so this is going to be the last month that the current book is available. It was amazing to be able to work on the book and release it and um, get so much nice feedback from you guys about it. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Uh, as Julian has said, this is going to be the last month that that ebook is available. And What's it, it will called? be... Do you remember what the ebook is called? <laughs> Where nothing is lacking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Five keys to Zizek. Five keys to Zizek, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, before it is replaced by the next book, which is going to be the book for this lecture series, The Useless Precaution, and that'll be posted at the beginning of August. That's right. So yeah, coming up soon. Coming up quickly. So we're going get, to get working on that. And uh, yeah. For those of you um, who are curious about our process, so Jenlyn basically edits the lecture transcripts into a <clears throat> short book format. And then I cut that down into an even shorter book <laughs> format. And so the idea is that if you sign up to our book tier on Patreon, it's essentially a subscription service where every three months we release a book version, an ebook version of the previous lecture series. So of all the lectures from the past three months, we condense that into like a hundred page ebook so that if you can't always keep up with the classes, you can at least download the ebook and enjoy reading it that way. <laughs> Plus, because it's a subscription service, it means that every class, every book is totally limited. So after three months, we move on to the next book. And if you've downloaded the ebook, then you're one of the lucky few who gets to enjoy it. So a huge thank you to all of our readers who have already downloaded the Five Keys to Zizek ebook. If you'd like to get it, there's still, I don't know, three and a half weeks that you can do so. <laughs> if you do it this month, then you can still get it. Okay. You can also ask, access the Discord where we'll host a Q&A session afterwards, uh, transcripts, audio download, podcast, all of that. So let us know where you're joining from. I, know, I, I see, see someone Nepal, from Nepal. I see India. Yeah. Uh, we are, of course, here in rainy Washington State. And... Uh, yeah, we just like knowing where you're joining us from because this is a wonderful global learning community. That's true. That is so, so true. We love, love, love hearing where you're joining us from. Um, the fact that there are people in India, people in Mexico, people across the world, Poland, who enjoy these classes, that is something that, honestly, if I'm having a bad day or if I'm up in the middle of the night, that's what I think about. Like, that is my happy place. So 
Thank you guys so much for sharing that. I see Canada. I see. I, see, like, I, 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 I don't even know how to process that. <laughs> Poland type Poland, too. That's yes. wonderful. Okay. That's wonderful. Thanks. Thank it guys. really means a lot to us. That is like, that is the most precious thing in the world. Someone from Iran. That's incredible. So thank you guys so much. And thank you again for supporting us and helping us teach these classes. This was our first ever lecture tour and it was beautiful and it was exhausting. So we're hoping to. <laughs> tour and keep us posted on the cities you'd like us to visit and we'll try to put that together for you maybe next year okay i think we should just jump right in yes it is the fourth of july today <laughs> by the way i hadn't noticed actually yeah um and it's sort of funny because i mean independence day yes <laughs> correct yes and in the united states and there's a quote from the legendary president de gaulle that kind of reminds me of the 4th of July. And I really like this quote. Um, he was a great rhetorician. The goal said that France has to be great because it is no longer a great nation. And I really like that quote, the idea that the greatness of a nation isn't measured by how great it is, but in a sense by the lack of greatness, that it's not just compensating, but that the idea of greatness has to be asserted precisely as an indicator of its waning greatness. Lots of greatness, yeah. <laughs> and it's almost a little bit like the Brechtian quote, where Brecht says, I think it's in Mother Courage, pity the nation that needs a hero. And you don't pity the nation that needs a hero because it is in need. You pity the nation because it thinks that what will save it is a hero. And... I like this idea that greatness, a nation that insists on its own greatness, is in a sense already betraying a kind of impotency as to conceptualizing what it really stands for. And this is also a little bit like how Freud's theory of parental authority works. Freud says that in the exact moment that the father lashes out, whether it's in anger or through physical violence, the father has already lost his authority. In other words, the gesture, the symbolic act that is supposed to be an assertion of the greatness of the father is in its very impotency a sign that the father is no longer great. And it's that kind of paradox that we're going to explore today, which is the paradox of difference and how difference relates to sexuality. And we're going to look at different approaches to male and female sexuality, whether it's Lacan, whether it's Althusser, whether it's Slavoj Žižek. Um, there's a story that I quite like that someone told to me yesterday. I think it was your parents. Mm. And something that they'd read in the newspaper about, it's, it's an insurance joke, but a real, it's a true story about a man who, uh, well, let me start like this. So there's a guy whose job is to remove the roof from houses. Is there a name for this? I know, he worked, he's probably like a roof repairman. A roof okay. repairman. And part of repairing a roof can be to remove the roof. Yes. And one day he goes to remove somebody's roof. Except he makes one big mistake, which is that he gets the wrong address. And so somebody comes home and they suddenly realize that they no longer have a roof. The roof has been removed. And this is where it gets kind of beautiful. The man who now suddenly is living in a house without a roof goes to his insurance and he says, I have roof insurance. I would like you to pay for another roof. And the guy from the insurance comes over to the house. You can probably predict at this point what he says. And he says, well, yes, ordinarily, you would be covered for roof insurance. But it appears that you have no roof. Thereby, we cannot cover you. There's no damage to the roof because you don't have a roof. Exactly. Your there's roof wasn't damaged, so we won't cover it. Technically, there can be no damage to your roof because there is no roof. And this is a perfect, to my mind, example of what in Hegelese would be called self-relating negativity. And one of Slavoj Žižek's key arguments throughout his work has simply been to take the idea of self-relating negativity from Hegel and to link it to the Lacanian conception of identity. Now, what is Lacan's theory of identity? Lacan's theory of identity is that identity equals pure difference. What does that mean? Let's think a little bit about difference for a moment. Lacan has this idea where he says that the other can be split into three versions of the other. 
This is where we have the famous Lacanian triad between the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. Your symbolic other, oh, let me start differently. Your imaginary other is the person you compete with in your mind. Whether it's someone you see on television, whether it's a character on a TV show, whether it's your neighbor, whether it's your sibling, every other relates to you in an imaginary fashion. You have an imaginary other, which is how you relate to the other person. After all, you can't really know what's going through their head at any given time. Think about our relationship for a moment between you as viewer and me as, I don't know what you want to call it, <laughs> educational influencer. <laughs> <laughs> the the idea is that we have an imaginary relationship to each other. I'm speaking and gesticulating into my phone on the assumption that you are watching and you are watching on the assumption that I'm a real person who is trying to communicate something to you. We have a strictly speaking imaginary relationship. Now what's key is that for Lacan, the fact that it's imaginary doesn't make it less real, but we'll get to that in a moment. So you have an imaginary other, and the manner in which you relate to your imaginary other is guided by the symbolic other. The symbolic other is what creates the playing field, if you will, the horizon that allows you to engage with the imaginary other. For example, you could say that we are now in the symbolic setting of a so-called classroom. Of course, we're already challenging those boundaries by doing it online and doing it internationally. But there is a pre-given set of coordinates by which you know what to expect from me and I, to some extent, know what to expect from you. In other words, our imaginary relationship to each other is guided by the coordinates of a symbolic other. The symbolic other can be the nation. The symbolic other can be a family, the symbolic other can be a contract that you have at work. There's many ways in which you are symbolically given the coordinates by which to relate to an imaginary other. And finally, we come to the real other. And the real other is where it gets interesting. The real other revolves around the fundamental question, what does the other want? In other words, what is the desire of the other? What is it that they want from me? This means that the real other is the fact that the other is ultimately unknowable to you. Now, what makes this the real? The reason it's the real for Lacan is because both our imaginary and our symbolic relation to the other are upheld by the idea that the other is in a sense real, true, authentic. That even if I am not fully inhabiting my own life, I can find a reason to fill in the blanks of my own existence by means of my relationship to imaginary others within the symbolic field of the symbolic other. In order to uphold both the relation of the imaginary other and the symbolic other to the imaginary, I have to hold on to the idea that the other exists, that you are complete, that you are authentic, that you do not suffer from the kind of inability to inhabit your own life that I do, that you stand on your own grounding, that you are a priori a, a person, if you will. For Lacan, the real is always what holds together the symbolic and the imaginary. And as soon as you unplug the real, the symbolic and the imaginary fall apart. This is also why the symbolic real is a kind of, for Lacan, a kind of abyss. It's the abyss of the uncertainty of what the other wants. Exactly. Someone in the comments says, what is the desire of the other? Now, Lacan gives a solution to this problem, how to evade this issue. And Lacan says that the simplest and yet most deceptive way of evading this problem is to elevate the real of the other to the level of the absolute. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that you say, I don't know what the other wants because the other is unknowable. And of course, another version 
Another way of saying the other is unknowable is to say the other is God. If you raise the other to the level of God, then you've raised the other to the level of the absolute, and you've raised the level of their desire to the level of the absolute. In other words, now it's no longer, I don't know what you want from me. Now it's, it's because I don't know what you want from me that I will follow you anywhere. We've raised it to the level of the absolute. Let me give you an example of what happens next. Once you find yourself stuck between the imaginary, I've got a hair in my mouth, sorry, between the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, fruitfully stuck, as it were, you have to supplement reality with fantasy. Zizek has a really, has a funny anecdote about this. Zizek says that he has a friend who is confronted with the slightly disturbing truth that children do when he's a child, that children don't in fact come from storks. <laughs> children are not brought to your window by a stork. Instead, children are the result of procreation between two adult human beings. Instead of simply embracing this reality, what he does is that he fuses the two versions of the truth. And so Zizek's friend says that when he was a child, he believed that while two people were having sex, a stork would arrive and observe them, and if the stork was pleased, then the stork would decide to bring them a child. It's a very beautiful <laughs> twist, and it's a, it's a very elegant solution, because the sex has to be supplemented by a fantasy, mm -hmm. namely the fantasy of erotic love or desire to have children. And yet he simply substitutes that erotic fantasy with the previous logic that had been upholding his worldview. And so now he can uphold the both of them. He's stuck in a pathological bind by which the truth of sex is made less traumatic by being reintegrated into the originating fantasy. Mm -hmm. Something similar happened to me when I was a child, except it was less sexual. When I was a child, I desperately wanted to have a, a giant Lego set for Christmas. And the problem was I was faced with the abyss of the other's desire, which is a fancy way of saying I wanted to have the Lego set, but I didn't know how to get the Lego set. If I went to my parents and I said I'd like to have this Lego set, they would never buy it for me. And so what I did instead was that I raised the desire of the other to the level of the absolute. The absolute was not God. The absolute was Santa. <laughs> and for about a month, I very diligently, this was work for me, would stay up at night with a catalog manifesting the Lego set, looking at my desired Lego set. And in a sense, what I imagined was that if Santa was going around the block trying to figure out what the child wants, <laughs> then he would conveniently see me looking at this page and know to give me the Lego set. Of course, I thought I was tricking Santa because I would sit there for hours <laughs> <laughs> so that when Santa showed up, I could feign a kind of indifference. Oh, Santa, it's funny that you're here. I just happen to be looking at this. <laughs> it's a little bit like... Anyway... So here we have, a, we have a similar thing. But, you know, the cruel and the painful part of this story I should share with you is that Christmas arrives. And I go to open the present. And there's a Lego set. Except it's the smaller Lego set. <laughs> and all I can remember was a terrible sense of disappointment in my own work ethic. <laughs> Because the fact that I had received the Lego set clearly proved the logic of my operation, which was that looking at the catalog to manifest the Santa my desire was had been successful. And yet, crucially and cruelly, it had not been successful enough. <laughs> if only I'd spent a couple more hours <laughs> looking at it. And so my pain, which would have been inexplicable to my parents, was that I worried that I'd sent Santa the wrong signal, that I should have been more clear that I wanted the big set and not the little set. 
Anyway, we can do many more childhood <laughs> stories like this. The point here for Lacan is that we find ourselves in an impossible position where there is never a direct overlap between the I of the ego and our subjective position in the world. Hence, we return to what Lacan says, which is that identity is simply difference which has been universalized. And the precondition for universalizing said difference into the illusion of identity is to insist upon the fact that the other is complete, that the other doesn't suffer from the same necessary inconsistency. Another way to say that identity is pure difference is to say that the only thing which is truly consistent is inconsistency mm -hmm. as such. This is also what Lacan then refers to as the non-all. There is no all, there is simply the all of non-all, as it were. I'm going to give you a couple more examples of this because it's still a little bit abstract. One of Zizek's, to my mind, most interesting ideas is that he, Zizek argues this. Zizek says, all difference is meta-difference. Which is another way of saying that there is never simply a difference between two things, but that the manner in which the difference between things is conceptualized is itself something over which one can differ. I'll give you an example from the political sphere, an example of how all difference is meta-difference. Think about the traditional idea that politics is divided between left and right. Zizek argues that to insist that the politics is divided between left and right is itself a leftist position. Why is that? Because to conceive of a society as being a reaction to an impossible center is itself the foundations of a progressive politics. And it's precisely a liberal centrist politics that tries to reject the idea of a left and a right, to suggest that left and right are deviations from the norm, from the golden ideal. And so one of the things that happens is that, strictly speaking, there is no center. If you think about there being a center within the political, you've already evaded, you've already, in a sense, pathologically denied the impossibility of a center being formed because of the left-right split. And so if you look at it, a leftist will insist that the true nature of politics lies in a fundamental antagonism, which the French political theorist Chantal Mouffe called agonism, which is the necessary and fruitful competition between different political points of view. And it's precisely the liberal centrist who will insist that the ideal is the center and that if we don't uphold and defend the center, we will succumb into a left and right divide, which would be the supposed end of political consensus. And so the manner in which you conceptualize difference, whether it's a difference between left and right, in which there is no center, or if you conceptualize the center as being the norm from which we divide ourselves into left and right as deviations from the ideal, you've conceptualized different in a fundamentally different way. In other words, all difference is meta-difference. When someone says that there is a difference between left and right, the manner in which they conceptualize said difference is itself a political statement, is itself a political gesture. Now, we can extrapolate from that the exact same logic for sexual difference. If you want to boil the patriarchy down to its most fundamental gesture, it's simply to insist that the difference between men and women is innate. That the difference between men and women is natural. That there is a binary divide between male and female. This is also why the fight about sexual orientation has become so vivid recently is that once you lose the illusion that the binary divide between male and female is innate and natural, you've lost the very founding order upon which your power rests and is established. And so we go again back to the idea of all difference is meta-difference. The manner in which you conceptualize difference, for example, between men and women, is itself a political gesture. 
if you insist on the biological sex versus the idea of gender, you've already conceptualized difference in a foundationally different way. And of course, everything hinges on how you conceptualize that difference. This is the, the, the point of hegemony, if you've heard this word hegemony. Hegemony is precisely the process by which you convince people to agree upon the same set of differences. I know that sounds confusing, but think about it like this. If you live in a liberal centrist society, you've convinced yourself that consensus is what ought to be the norm. And that deviation from said norm is a breakdown into populist barbarity. But the argument that the post althusserians have always made, which is key to the theory of hegemony, is that there is never such a thing as consensus as such. Consensus doesn't exist a priori. Consensus is when you've put aside minimal differences and insisted that this is the norm. In other words, consensus isn't when you've reached the compromise between two parties. Consensus is the insistence that there is no difference. And that's why it's precisely the most radical political act and gesture that you can make is to insist on conceptualizing difference differently. That's precisely what it means to be a feminist today, is not to is insist on the equality of men and women, but precisely to reconceptualize on what the difference between men and women is. Not to say, here's man versus woman, but to say, how do we differentiate the supposed difference between man and woman itself? And think about it, this is why the feminist movement for equality is in a sense limited, because it upholds the idea that there is a male and female block, and that we live in a male-dominated world, and if women can simply become more like men and enjoy the rights of men in society, that we will no longer have difference between men and women. And so we find ourselves back at the hegemonic consensual argument, which is that there is a supposedly universal frame to which both men and women can grant and gain access. And this is precisely the Hegelian, Zizekian, Lacanian critique, which is always to be deeply suspicious of the universal. Instead of rising up to the universal as a supposedly progressive emancipatory gesture, you have to dig down into the coordinates by which difference is made manifest. For example, on a very practical common sense level, one of the things that we see when war breaks out is always this insistence on why are we killing each other? Aren't we all just human beings? If only we could have peace and then we could see that we're all the same. We could see the world the same. The insistence on similarity is invoked as a kind of peaceful gesture. When it's precisely the other way around, the only way to find your way out of a war conflict situation is precisely to properly articulate what the differences are. This is the problem with the multicultural approach, which is to say that if multiculturalism is simply supposed to be the supposed umbrella under which many different religions and ethnicities can participate equally, this, then this can only function under the auspices of a disavowed inequality that persists within said society. This is the problem of the universal liberal level of tolerance. Who gets to tolerate whom? If tolerance is supposed to be the equal playing field upon which all human beings can participate equally, then it can only be done on the level of disavowal of the ingrained intolerance that persists within tolerance itself. And so intolerance is made manifest precisely within the idea of tolerance, paradoxically, in the same manner that war is precisely fought under the auspices of peace. Again, for the second time today, Brecht's Mother Courage, don't tell me that peace has broken out. And if you look at the wars that the Dutch waged in the 1970s in Indonesia, these were politional actions supposed to preserve the peace. Think about Russia's war in Ukraine, supposed to preserve the peace. Think about American wars in the Middle East, supposed to spread peace. Peace, rather than being the antithesis to war, the universal level in which war is eliminated, turns out in a very ugly about face to be exactly and precisely the manner in which war perpetuates. 
In the same manner that if you raise, for example, feminism and the emancipation of women to the idea that women and men should be equal in society, this is precisely how inequality persists in another name. It's fundamentally the same argument that Marx makes apropos workers' right, which is to say that the revolution isn't to insist on better pay and more representation. The revolution is to insist on getting rid of the structure of differentiation itself. What is the structure of differentiation? It's the class structure. This is also why Marx says that what makes a working class unique is precisely that they are not a natural class. The insistence that there is such a thing as an a priori innate natural class by which the coordinates, which is the symbolic system of differentiation by which you participate in a society on the level of the imaginary, it's precisely to undermine those coordinates. And so again, if you want to connect Marx and Jacques and Lacan, difference exists on the level of the real. Pick a difference and the symbolic and the imaginary fall apart as well, and you exist in a kind of new progressive potential. Something which is as of yet not mediated by difference because difference has as of yet not been filled in. Now, I'm, that was quite abstract, so let's take a step back. Lacan has a very interesting definition of the sublime. Lacan says that the sublime, or maybe I'll take a cup, sip of coffee here, and I'll take a little break. <laughs> I like that the idea of sublime prompts you too. That's yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little interruption here. So when we were teaching Europe on our lecture tour, the classes were at 5 p.m. and in the UK they were at 4 p.m., which is a very respectable time to teach. Now that we're back in the United States on the West Coast, the classes are at 8 a.m., which is a challenge. <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you. Okay, let's, so Lacan is a very interesting, Lacan is an interesting definition of the sublime. He says, the sublime is the object elevated to the level of the thing. Okay, <laughs> let's unpack that. What is the difference between the object and the thing? Well, the thing is simply the object that has been imbued with fantasy. Let me give you an example. This is one from Zizek. Zizek says, what is an example of the object elevated to the level of the thing? And he says, the object elevated to the level of the thing would be, for example, the female sex organ, vagina. Which, interestingly enough, you think about how taboo it is to even use the word. And what Zizek argues is that the only way to quote unquote authentically or naturally relate to the female sex organ within sexual copulation isn't to treat it as a functional object. You have to imbue it with fantasy. You have to elevate it to the thing, the mythic sexualized thing. Mm. There's, a, there's an example of this that I want to give you that I saw in the Kardashians. Jen Lee and I were watching like season 10 of the Kardashians, and which is from six years ago, I think. <laughs> and the character Scott, who is usually represented as like the id of the male id of the show, who in a sense elevates the women and taste and decency and rhetoric compared to his, you know, his crassness. And there's a scene in which, and this is very crass, I warn you, in which Scott says that he no longer gives oral sex to his wife. And Car Kim Kardashian is out shocked by this. She says, why wouldn't you give oral sex to your wife? Don't you know good sexual practice means give and take? And Scott reacts with a very properly Lacanian outrage. And Scott says, why would I give oral sex to my wife? Now that I know that a baby can come out of it. <laughs> and this is exactly the Lacanian response, which is that as long as you elevate the object to the level of the thing, the mystic, idealized, sexualized vagina, you are okay. You can function within reality. As soon as you strip reality from its fantastical mechanism, it becomes simply an object, which is fulfilling a purpose, and now you can no longer relate to it on that level. <laughs> And so Scott, in a sense, as, as you know, as sexist as this is, Scott is making a perfectly valid point, which is, I can no longer engage with the vagina sexually now that I know that it is an object of producing my child, as it were. Now, what's really key here is that Lacan isn't insisting on a kind of pseudo-platonic transcendental divide between reality and fantasy. 
Lacan isn't saying that as long as you treat the vagina as a thing, as an as a, as a sublime thing, that you are in the level of the fantasy and you have to wake up to reality and embrace the fact that you have to respect women's sex organs being, you know, utilitarian objects in that sense. Lacan makes a much more sneaky argument, but it's really important. Lacan says that there is no real difference between reality and fantasy. The only way to access reality is through fantasy. And so to insist that the vagina is a hole out of which children come is precisely not reality. That is a pathological inability to deal with the necessary libidinal fantastical level with which the vagina has to be imbued in order for reality to work. And so Scott is, of course, wrong. Scott is traumatized pathologically <laughs> because he can no longer mix the two truths with the proper fantasy. Let's go back to the story I told in the beginning. The man who discovers that children come not from storks, but from having sex. And the way in which he tries to fill this gap is by saying, well, you have sex and the stork watches you and if the stork approves, it will bring you a child. So he upholds the original fantasy by integrating the truth into fantasy. This is, for Lacan, a pathological foreclosure. Namely, instead of saying, I act reality through fantasy, it's to take reality and plug it back into fantasy. That's what's dangerous. That's when you live on the level of mania, as it were. If you take reality and you plug it into fantasy, you are lost. However, if you take fantasy and you plug it into reality, you are redeemed. Does that mechanism make sense? Let me give you an example. Lacan calls this traversing the fantasy. So Lacan says what happens is that there's a situation in which you are confronted with the real, right? The fact that every reality is supplemented by a fantasy. But there's a nodal point. There's like one little piece that can make it disintegrate completely. And suddenly you find yourself in a completely new imaginary symbolic horizon called like a little revolution. And ironically, we see this moment in one of the most inexplicable narrative sequences that has ever been put in a comic book movie, which is Batman versus Superman. <laughs> when Batman and Superman are fighting and they're in their climactic showdown, there's a moment in which they suddenly realize that their mothers share the same name, that their mothers are both called Martha. And it completely short circuits their fight. And the fight effectively ends. But what's so confusing about the sequence is that it's not because they have a repressed trauma about their mother. It's not because the mother suggests some kind of infantile desire. There's no way in which the knowledge of the mother's name would logically undermine the necessity of their fight. Instead, the mother's name, the synchronicity of their mother's overlapping name, is the real. It is the thing that suddenly disrupts the supposedly ordinary functioning of the battle between these two great mythological heroes. And by poking at this sudden thing, which is discordant precisely by the fact that it is not discordant, that it is too horrifically overlapping, that the symbolic and the imaginary relation by which their fight had found its necessary coordinates suddenly falls away and crumbles into nothing. And that's the moment of saying, Martha. Go back to the idea that the sublime is simply elevating the object into the thing. The exact inversion of that is to say that as soon as you insist that the thing is something which is by itself thing without the repressed knowledge of the object, you found yourself in an impossible abyss. Because what is the sublime? Think about it for Kant for a moment. The sublime isn't saying, I can reach God. The sublime is never saying, I can actually depict the divine, whether it's through art or speech or life. The sublime is precisely the fruitful impossibility of being able to access the transcendental. My picture of God has to be a picture of a storm. My music, which is trying to express my love and pain, is necessarily a failure. 
all sublimity is figuration. It is the fruitful and yet impossible attempt to accurately portray something in its essence. And of course, ironically, and this is something that Kant already knew, and this is where Kant differs from the Burkean sublime, this is the only way that we access essence. This is exactly the metaphysical temptation. The idea that behind appearance, essence exists. When it's in fact precisely through the fall, the impossibility of accessing essence, that we find essence within appearance itself. That's the Hegelian move apropos the Kantian sublime. It's simply elevating the idea of the Kantian sublime, which is that every failure to depict essence is fruitful, to say that this failure to depict essence, whether through life or speech or art, is precisely how essence is made manifest. Now let's go back to the Lacanian argument that the sublime is simply elevating the object to the level of the thing. Instead of saying we have on the one hand material reality versus fantasy, one being elevated, right? The mythical ideal of the thing versus the vulgar debased reality. For example, the female sex organ, the idea of the vagina as the ultimate symbol of fertility and motherhood and life versus the debased knowledge of a sex organ that produces children. For Lacan, it's to say that there is no essence except by going through the horrific knowledge of the object. In other words, not being able to cope with the object has to be supplemented by a sublime fantasy. And for Lacan, what's key here is that there's no way to then say, let's get rid of the sublime fantasy to go back to the truth of the object. Mm -hmm. The truth of the object in its vulgar material form is precisely deceptive, is precisely the least true version of it. And so you have to go through the object and elevate it to the level of the thing. In other words, you have to supplement reality with fantasy in order to arrive at reality. The ultimate illusion is thereby precisely the idea that if you strip fantasy of its fantastical supplement, you will arrive back at the idea of innate natural materialism. In this sense, all materialism is vulgar materialism. And it's precisely this is something that people miss about Marx all the time. What makes dialectical materialism not vulgar materialism is precisely that it elevates the object to the level of the thing. In other words, material reality isn't simply the innate natural value of a thing, which would be bourgeois ideology, but it's precisely the repressed pathological thing that has to be traversed through the idea of the progression of history itself. Dialectical materialism is an escape from the vulgar materialism of the insistence on the innate natural value of goods, which is key and foundational to the idea of the bourgeois value structure and ethic, what is also called bourgeois morality. Now, let's go back to female versus male sexuality, because we're, <laughs> all of this is woven in together. I'm going to open the door for a moment because it's very warm. <laughs> all right. So, Althusser has an interesting theory of male versus female sexuality that we can relate to Lacan and Zizek. Althusser, who's most well known for his theory of interpolation and his theory of ideology, argues that women, and this is something that may surprise you, women are fundamentally hysterical. Now, before we all start screaming about <laughs> the manner in which this is sexist and the cliche about female hysteria, etc. And of course, authors would say this, yes. It's important to acknowledge here that hysteria is being used in a very different sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, for a very long time, even up to today, perhaps, hysteria was used as a convenient excuse to rationalize away women's very understandable pathological response to being cooped up, existing without rights, without bodily autonomy, without legal representation, without financial autonomy, and the insistence that this was supposedly the natural state of women led and to... And it was in women's own interest. Yeah. It was for their protection. It was yeah. for their... Yeah. Exactly. Of course, any resistance to this norm mm -hmm. would be rationalized as 
his stereo. And yet, if we take away the political element of that, clinically within psychoanalysis, hysteria is simply this. Hysteria is saying, what am I to you? In other words, hysteria is the process by which your identity is overdetermined by the other. And what Althusser argues when he says that women are innately hysterical isn't to say that women are these frail creatures who cannot cope with the world. That's Trump. It's almost exactly the opposite, which is to say within the structure of the patriarchy, within the structure of sexual differentiation, women are forced to find identity in relation to male power. And so the female question becomes, what am I to you? And this can be precisely a liberating progressive gesture. Think about the Supreme Court decision from last week. The necessary response is precisely to say, why would the, why would the Supreme Court be allowed to dictate my access to reproductive health, to who I am as a woman, and so on and so forth? Strictly speaking, if your identity is overdetermined by the courts, you have found yourself unwantingly in a hysterical relationship to the court. The shocking and horrific insight of women across the United States was precisely this awakening to the fact that what is fundamental to the core of your very being, namely your womanhood, can suddenly be overdetermined by a bunch of old men sitting in an old building. That reality is painful and horrific and shocking and outrageous. And that is precisely the level of hysteria. Namely, what am I to you is always mirrored by the fact that what you've decided I am, I now have to be. That is the painful reality of the, Roe v of the overturning of Roe v. Wade is that even if you don't think what the court says applies to you, legally and symbolically, it now does. And that's an overwhelmingly painful realization. And so when Althusser says that woman is innately hysterical, what he means is that, that since women are not granted the autonomy of being the universal of society, since women live within the patriarchy, he doesn't make it explicit in those feminist terms, but women's identity by male identity. Now, Althusser is sneaky, though, because he has a, he's not saying that men have a better than women. He says, if the fundamental female question is to say, what am I to you? And he says, the male question is almost worse. The male question is, am I really a man? In other words, if the female position is, I don't exist, I'm not granted autonomous universal womanhood, except under the auspices and condition of a male world, my question is, what am I to you? The male is confronted with a more <laughs> abyss-like question, which is, since I am now the arbiter of the universal, am I truly a man? There's a joke from Karl Lagerfeld, because Karl Lagerfeld, of course, made clothing for women. And Lagerfeld said, what makes it so wonderful to design clothes for women is that women know exactly what they want, but they don't know who they are. Now, that sounds very sexist, I understand that, but he means it as an emancipatory potential, which is that their identity is as of yet undefined precisely because it's not the pinnacle around which the symbolic order is designed. <laughs> and so women can exercise precisely the freedom to insist on what they want, a freedom that makes men very anxious and scared. And so like, Lagerfeld says women know exactly what they want, but they don't know who they are. In other words, they can be more, they can be anything. The male anxiety for Althusser is precisely to say, am I truly a man? My favorite scene from the, Jenny will know this, my favorite scene from the Peep comedy show. series Peep Show is when there is a man who is, one of the men who's, let's say, not alpha male, is struggling a little bit with insecurity. And so his best friend, who's more of a, let's say, alpha in the show, says, well, what you have to do is every morning you have to wake up and you have to look in the mirror and you have to say, I'm the man. I'm the man. And so in the morning, the man wakes up. He puts on his shirt, you know, a slightly effeminate character. And he goes into the bathroom. And he says the motivational alpha slogan. 
except for one key difference, which fundamentally undermines it from within. He looks into the mirror and he says, I am a man. I am a man. I am a man. And he says, I am a man. I am a man. And like, he hypes himself up. But here's, here's where the article is so important between the man and a man, which is that the insistence on, this is the Althusserian anxiety, which is the only way that you overcome the anxiety, am I a man, is precisely to insist that you are the man. Because the horrific existential question is precisely, am I a man? And of course, this is what the patriarchy is. It's a fundamental reaction to the anxiety, the pathological impossibility of men to confront the abyss of the question, am I a man? And so have to insist, I am the man, which means that vice versa, you have to insist that women are in fact true women. This is Lacan's theory of sexuation. When he says there is no sexual relation, there is no female sexuality, what he means is that the insistence that women are fully, truly, wholesomely, universally women is precisely the painful, paradoxical, pathological refraction of the fact that men are trying to insist on the universal of man, which they know to be broken and flawed from within, which you can find in the previous lecture. We did a big part of that as well. This also, <laughs> Freud... Freud has a dream about impotency. Freud says, this is how you can write it. Freud says that the dream about being impotent isn't to dream of not having a penis. The dream of impotency, the symbol of too many penises and like a Jungian, mm -hmm. of, the symbol of impotency is dreaming about many penises. <laughs> In other words, the sign of no penis isn't absence of penis. The sign of of impotency is too many penises, <laughs> lots of penises. In other words, the absence, the all becomes the indicator of the non-all. This goes back to the theory of potent impotency. Power emerges precisely as the pathological response to impotency. For Freud, the castration complex isn't to say, I feel weak. It's to assert power to cover your weakness. Every act of strength or courage even when it's good, is a response to never wanting to be seen or felt to be weak again. In the same way that the father's angry response that we talked about in the beginning of this lecture is already an indication of his weakness, his outburst, his strength, is precisely weakness in its inversed form. There is no strength outside of impotence, as it were. And this is precisely the male power of I am the man is predicated on the fundamental anxiety and weakness of am I a man. And so strength comes as the masqueraded version of impotency and weakness. And what men fear is precisely the idea that female strength wouldn't come from this pathological divide, that there is a kind of urgrund of female sexuality that doesn't exist within this fundamental structure of differentiation. Now we can get to Zizek's theory of sexuality. Zizek says all difference is meta-difference. Sexual differentiation is thereby meta-difference. The idea of sexual differentiation between male and female is itself a male fantasy, is itself a male illusion. To insist on the idea that there's a strict sexual relationship between men and women, whether it's sexual biological, is itself a male insistence, which is trying to uphold the inconsistency within male sexuality itself, trying to paper over that gap by insisting that woman is real, that woman is in fact the binary other. And so we find ourselves back in the Lacanian divide between the imaginary other, the symbolic other, and the real other. If the imaginary other is woman, if symbolic other is the manner in which men and women are supposed to relate in the society that is built around it, right, which is supposedly innately thereby natural, the real other is thereby the necessary fundamental illusion that woman is complete. That And this is also like, remember Freud's supposedly sexist deathbed remarks were, what does woman want? Was will das Weib? But this is precisely the question you have to ask to pick at differentiation from within, which is, if man is stuck within the illusion that woman is complete, 
that woman doesn't succumb to differentiation. In other words, that woman is not an identity that is constitutively split through a kind of fundamental marker of difference. Man has to insist that woman is absolute. In other words, we go back to Lacan's solution to the abyss of the real other, which is to raise it to the level of the absolute. And so the patriarchy functions precisely by elevating female sexuality to the level of the absolute, to insist that true feminine sexuality has to be guarded and protected from supposedly debased, vulgar, objective materiality. And so the male position, the differentiation, is precisely to insist that woman is perfect, that woman exists. That is Lacan's argument about sexuation, is to say that the patriarchy is upheld. He doesn't make it a feminist argument, but that male sexuality, in its supposed completeness, its pathological response to its differentiating structure, is upheld by the pathological insistence that woman is complete, by elevating woman to the level of the sublime. And that, yeah, you were going to say? Yeah, and that's also, I think, the preoccupation with the notion of, like, protecting women or defending women is the idea that there is this perfect idea of womanhood and men, whether it's men on the Supreme Court or yeah. wherever, their responsibility is defending this idealized notion of Exactly. Yeah. And so, to go back to why is war fought on the auspices of peace, the hatred of women is always fought under the auspices of the love of women, protecting woman, idealizing woman, making woman into the sublime thing. Now, I want to end here, because we've already done an hour, on a 4th of July note, which is that Zizek has a joke about the band Leibach, hmm. which I really like. It's a, and the band Leibach says, there's a difference between us and you Americans, which is that all you have to do is look at a dollar bill and you'll see the difference. The difference between us and you Americans is that the dollar bill says, in God we trust. Well, we definitely believe in God, but we don't trust him. And this is a very important progressive gesture, which is that on the one hand, in order to access reality, you have to supplement it with fantasy. You can't just engage with the horrific object, ob object. It has to be object as thing. You have to relate it to this myth mythical element. That's in itself not bad. But you can't trust it. You cannot trust it to provide you with the coordinates of your existence. Instead, you have to do what Lacan calls traversing the fantasy. Traversing the fantasy is realizing the necessary arbitrary relationship between the symbolic and the imaginary that is supposedly upheld by the real. Once you realize the emptiness of the real, you can reframe the way in which the imaginary and the symbolic function. If your imaginary relation is your relation to others, how you think you come across as a person, how they come across to you, the manner in which you fill in the motives and the structures of why you're doing something through almost narrative sequence, whether it's through movies or through books or through your relationship to others or experiences, the way in which you create a fabric of your own existence, this is imaginary, but it is governed by the symbolic. And that the only way to change yourself and the symbolic isn't to say, I need to be better integrated into the symbolic or the symbolic needs to be better integrated into my imaginary. It's to address it at the level of the real. The real, the real's realness is precisely its emptiness. Pure Identity is simply pure differentiation. Any emancipatory progress, any revolutionary struggle isn't about trying to be better represented or better integrated within the symbolic. It's to expose the emptiness of the symbolic itself. And what has happened, of course, recently with the Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade is precisely that the emptiness of the symbolic has been exposed. That the horrific overdetermining weight of a decision made in the court, that that symbolic imaginary, just words, has a real material impact on women's lives or lack thereof. That discordance has now made more aware to people. It is no longer simply considered natural innate that a small group of conservative old white men 
could dictate the lived reality of millions of women. And within that, we find a little revolutionary awakening, which is that it's not that it's just words. It's precisely that it's just words and that the manner in which you fill in those just words can have enormous revolutionary impact on the lived reality that we have. And so it's precisely by saying, yes, we've elevated lived material reality to this level of the absolute, just words in a court, this mythic sublime element, but we don't trust it. Yes, we believe in the sublime. We believe in the idea of institutions and organizations mm -hmm. that can almost magically dictate our lived material reality by infusing it with symbolic imaginary relations, laws, customs, but we don't trust it. And because we don't trust it, we can try to reframe it and articulate it differently. And so it isn't to say, let's get rid of the courts, let's get rid of the idea of laws, let's live in a kind of pre-symbolic, pre-modern anarchy. It's precisely to say we no longer trust the manner in which the sublime is being filled in because we have come to realize that it dictates the coordinates of our lived reality. And that instead of trying to change our lived reality through incremental lifestyle changes, we will go up to the sublime and replace the sublime with something that will fill in our lived reality differently. And of course, this is exactly the ideology within capitalism is always to insist that the way in which you quote unquote change the world is by small incremental personal lifestyle changes that fundamentally do nothing to alter the governing more sublime structures that, that fill in the symbolic imaginary coordinates by which you can actually enact those changes. And so you find yourself in a position where you end up in a much more radical position which is to say, rather than having these small incremental personal changes, which fundamentally exist only to be co-opted with the continued insurance of the system as it is, that the only way to change lived reality is precisely to go up to the metaphysical level of just words and to change those structures so as to change the lived realities here. That is the more revolutionary, progressive, emancipatory insight that you have to take or you can take from the Lacanian idea that identity is never just identity, but it is difference raised to the level of the universal. Or Zizek's argument that all difference is meta difference. It is fundamentally a political argument. Hence also why Althusser is interested in. Althusser is not a psychoanalyst. Althusser is interested in the power imbalance between the way in which the male view is to insist on a supposedly natural innate difference between men and women to mask the anxiety of the question, am I a man? The impossibility of living up to that universal horizon of male being, which has to be suppressed by the insistence that woman is complete, which leads to the totally natural response from woman who says, what am I to you? And the paradox is thereby that control never takes place under the auspices of male domination of a female weak species, but precisely the other way around, that the inner core and the inner inconsistency of male universal sexuation has to be masked over and covered through the insistence that woman is more complete than she actually is. And breaking free from this completeness, which provides the continual excuse for the oppression and domination of women, is precisely the proto, I'm uh, sorry, the most important feminist gesture. That's me as a man ranting about feminism, but that's it. That's the lecture. I, it was a hard one, but I enjoyed doing it. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Jenlene. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you for joining us for part two of the lecture. You can listen to it. You can also read it as an essay. That's right. Sometime in the next week. Yeah. Uh, There's yeah. three more weeks to get the book. Yep. I think. Three more weeks to get the book and then use this precaution. That's Thank right. you very much for teaching this lecture. Thank you so much for joining us. We are back in the United States. And if you'd like to support our teaching, if you'd like to support, I don't know, the travels, if you'd like to read the ebook, if you'd like to just be a part of the learning community, please do consider joining our Patreon. It starts at just $5 a month. Um, and it really keeps this dream alive, the dream of open access, global education. So thank you guys so much. Genuinely, genuinely so happy to be back in the United States and hope that you are having a good start of your week. 
We're going to see you in five minutes on Discord for those of you who are patrons. And in five minutes, we'll be taking your questions and recording a Q&A. So if you'd like to download that as a podcast, um, that's always available on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. We love you all, and we will see you next week. Next week. Take care.